There we go. So here's an example um, of this, if you were sending this call, uh, KI7GUO from K6GMH, you can see that uh, when you come to a, to a number, you have to send a control character to tell the other station that you're now going to be in the other half of the, of the character set. And so that's what you'll see here I've got in the kind of the light font here is the letters, control character, figures, letters, and so forth as you go through this, this sequence. And one of the important things to understand about this is that if you get a noise hit on one of those control characters, it messes up everything until you get another control character because you'll be in the wrong um, character set, right? It won't switch. If you had noise on one character, especially if it's a word, you can usually figure out what it is. I mean, it still makes sense, but if you miss up yeah. one of those control characters, uh, it's a bigger problem. And there's uh, some ways around that that we'll talk about. So uh, in really the two tones are called uh, mark and space. Mark is, uh, it's a digital, uh, you know, bit code. And so mark is the one um, and space is, is zero. And the audio tones, typically the default on most equipment is uh, up around two kilohertz, which is really high. And if you listen to that for very long, it's very fatiguing. And so I recommend that you actually move off the default and go to a lower tone and it's much, much less uh, fatiguing. And again, as I said earlier, it's analogous to CW pitch. And these tones, the audio tones that you're listening to are totally your choice. It's just like each of us has different uh, CW tips that we listen to. I happen to like around 400, other people like 600 or 800. And so it's the same thing in ready. You can choose whatever you want. I personally recommend uh, the lower the better because it's just less, less fatiguing. The next thing to understand about ready is how the transmission is done. There's two basic ways that transmitting is done. Receiving is the same. So receiving is just the RF signals, you know, converted to audio in your receiver. It goes into a decoder and prints out on, on the screen. But in terms of generating uh, RIDI, there's two ways. One is AFSK, audio frequency shifting, and FSK, which is frequency shifting. Let me talk about frequency shifting first. Because it's analogous again to CW, it's just on off keying, and your radio has to have a, a jack, a connector, a port, just like you would for CW um, for FSK, and then it can receive these, these on off keying and convert it into the, to the bottom code. And so that's FSK, and it, uh, the hardware setup is exactly what you would do for keying CW. AFSK is the actual audio tones going into the audio amplifier in the transmitter. And so those get converted to RF. And uh, instead of uh, actually physically keying, you're just sending the actual audio tones like, like you would hear with your, with your ear. The thing that um, used to be a big problem, and it's not so much anymore because most modern radios, um, the when you're in the ready mode, they, they usually have a ready mode, you go to that, the dial frequency will be the mark frequency. That's the standard when someone says, I'm gonna meet you on XYZ frequency for ready, they're talking about the mark frequency. Because remember I said there's two characters, I mean two carriers, one is the mark and one is the space, and they're in the RIDI uh, protocol that we use, they're 170 hertz apart. But if you're using AFSK with an older transmitter, older transceiver, and going in through the uh, audio uh, portion, and you're not in, say you're in lower sideband mode, the dial frequency is going to read the suppressed carrier frequency, right? And it's going to be off by whatever your local tones are. And if you're at two kilohertz, you're going to be your frequency you're telling you're going to be on is going to be off by two kilohertz. If I'm listening, if my local tones are one kilohertz, then I'm going to be off one kilohertz. So this slide just goes through the detail of how all that math works out. Um, but I guess I would say nowadays, probably most of us have 
um, modern enough radios that when you're in the ready mode, uh, what you see on the screen is the or on the display is the mark frequency. So you don't really need to worry about this. But if you see a spot or you see somebody that's off by two kilohertz, this is the reason. So this slide just goes through and talks about comparing uh, AFS tapes to FS tapes. This is one of these uh, religious arguments in, in ham radio. Uh, some people are fervently um, you know, tied to one of these ways of transmitting versus the other. I personally prefer FSK, but I don't advocate that as being better or worse than AFSK. It really depends on um, what, what you're comfortable with. For me, FSK is like CW King. When it's working, there's there's no adjustments. It's just gone off team. AFSK, you have to make sure that you're not over driving the uh, radio and creating distortion, but you're driving it enough to get the you know full power out. And so there's just adjustments, especially in a contesting environment, that uh, there's lots of things going on and things can change. And I just don't want to to, to deal with that uncertainty. A real positive of AFSK is that it's exactly the same radio and computer hardware setup as FTA or ESK or any any of the other digital modes. Ridley is the only one that that really has this um, ability to do uh, FSK uh, team by itself. So this is just the summary side of what we talked about, kind of defining what what Ridley is. So I'm going to move into uh, operating. There's kind of two cynical things that you'll hear in, in ham radio about, about RIDI. And the first one has to do with operating. And I was um, a very good example of this. In 2004, the NCCC had a meeting, and uh, there were three or four RIDI guys in the club. And they, the, the Ada Royal, the next um, uh, January, was going to have the uh, first club competition in the Ridley Roundup, which was held in January, it's just a, it was a week ago, in fact. And so they were trying to get everybody in the club to get on Ridley to try to win this club competition. Well, I went in, I had my heels dug in, kicking and screaming, but I opened my mouth and I said something like this. I said, look, it seems to me, I listened to your presentation, it seems to me that the computer is decoding all this stuff and it's sending it out you could just set up the computer to work somebody else's computer and go in the next room and have a beer. And that did it. They said, okay, you're going to get on the air and you're going to help us in this contest. And uh, that turned me into a monster. But one of the things I learned is that, yes, there's a lot of um, automation, if you will, or, you know, you don't have to copy really because you can't. It, you know, you have a decoder to help you with that. But what that does is it frees you up to do other things. Now, you could watch a game, a sports game, or you could read a book, um, or you could, you know, go through your email, or you could try to improve your operating, maybe uh, operate SO2R, or, or try to do some other things to push yourself to operate um, in, uh, and just stretch your, your skills and develop some other ham radio skills rather than um, doing something else on the side. So these are some of the considerations. Um, I like to compare it to CW and sideband because that's what most of us are familiar with. And so, of course, there's uh, the non-human uh, uh, decoding uh, implications. Uh, since we don't, there's no way to tell whether you've got good copy or not um, unless the message is repeated and you get the same thing twice on the screen. Or with CW and sideband, there's enough context you can usually tell if you got it right, or you can kind of, your brain can fill in spots, that's uh, impossible to do with, with Ritty. And then I talk about the uh, distractions and the, and the key down. These, uh, this is just a list of kind of the typical subbands. It's basically the high end of the, of the CW uh, subband in contest. Uh, it goes all the way down into uh, where CW is. Um, but from day to day, these are uh, kind of the typical subbands where you'll find uh, RIDI. So for uh, RIDI, uh, to do a RIDI QSO, there's kind of three methods. I say there's two because I have X out the third one. Um, 
for most of our purchases. Right? So one is you can just do free typing. You can uh, do Alt K on your keyboard and it just brings up a, a little window and you can just type and everything you type gets converted to ready and sent out and it's printed on the other person's screen. And if you're fast enough, adept at that, you can carry on a conversation and um, and that works fine. In fact, I know a lot of CW operators that uh, don't use a paddle and can actually do that um, and carry on a conversation with no gaps or, or pauses or anything. And they're very uh, fast at it. I remember the WRTC um, in uh, in Germany eight years ago, I was uh, refereeing for a Slovenian team and they were setting up before WRTC and the one, their, their uh, team of two people and the one partner set up his paddle and everything. And I was watching the other guy, there was no paddle in sight. He just set up a keyboard and he operated the whole 24 hour contest just with a keyboard. I was listening, you know, the whole time to what was going on. It just sounded like he was grabbing a paddle and he just he was that good. So you can do the same thing with um, with Riddy. Or you can uh, send prepared messages just like with CW or sideband. One of the things that uh, you'll find um, not too much now, but once in a while, is what's called a drag page. And this is where somebody has made a message that's very long and includes everything, including their grandmother's wedding day and the weather in Nebraska and so forth. And um, that gets kind of annoying sometimes if you're um, DXing or something and somebody comes on with a, something that's four or five lines long on your screen, because it does take a while to, to print out. So uh, probably don't, don't want to be doing right things. This slide just uh, is to emphasize um, when you do messages with Riddy, you have to turn on the transmission. So one of the first things, depending on what logging you're using um, in the start off the line, this happens to be right log, or sent R is the, is the command that, that basically turns on the transmitter and then everything after that is, is the messages. And at the end, you have to have another command that drops switch to talk and, and stops the transmission. So other than that, the messages would look just like CW or, uh, well, CW messages. And this is just some more um, comments on the, on the formatting. So one of the things that will happen, uh, and it still happens to me after doing this for 25 years, is you'll set up and you'll start copying and all you get is gibberish on the, on the screen. You know, you get your characters, but they don't make any sense. So what's going on? Well, uh, the most common thing is what we call is upside down. And this means that the the polarity, that is the logic of the mark and space bits are reversed. And most radios actually have that in the configuration in the radio. The encoders and decoders have a reverse uh, button on it. And so somewhere in your chain of, of setup, you've got one of those reverse. All you need to do is, is put it back, put the polarity back, and, and uh, it works. But that's one of the things that will happen. The other thing is that if you're using AFSK with a traditional uh, sideband transceiver, the difference between uh, upper sideband and lower sideband will reverse the mark and space tones, right? If you think about it. So... That's how you can get, get them reversed as well. So there's different ways that that can happen. And then, as I mentioned earlier about the figures and letters um, cases, if one of those control characters, like the letters control character, gets knocked out or you don't receive it properly and you're still in the figure case, then everything is going to come across as numbers, even though they were really letters that were, that were uh, transmitted. And one of the tricks is if you look at a keyboard, it just so happens that the Vado code, the two letter, the two uh, character sets, the same five bit code is uh, above and below each other. If you look at the, the numbers along the top row, the letter right below the number is the same five bit code in the other character set. So one of the tricks you can do um, is when you see something you suspect is a number, but it's letters, you just look at your keyboard and convert it. And of course, now with our software, almost any um, really software, all you need to do is hold down the shift key when you mouse click on, say, TOO, 
came across is you put the, the mouse on T and hold down the, the shift key and click it, it will convert it to 599, which is the, the correct number. So you can do that instantly in your in your software. I think N1MM has uh, actually has it above the window. So that it, it, you don't even have to click on anything. It has right above what the uh, what it would be in the other character sets. You can instantly see if there's uh, something wrong. Uh, and then, as I talked earlier about AFSK, the audio level in and the tones and flutter, uh, you know, band conditions can, can affect things. So all of these things can uh, can make you uh, appear that you're receiving gibberish. And on the other side, maybe you're receiving okay, but you answer somebody, you call somebody, and they don't come back. They ignore you. Uh, or maybe, uh, uh, well, if you're not copying them, uh, clearly, then you wouldn't know. But if you are copying them, then they're, they may come back and say, you're upside down, or you're very loud, but I'm not printing anything that makes sense. And that's uh, the same sorts of things can be happening on your transmit up. You can be, uh, the polarity can be wrong. You can be off frequency. Uh, one of the things that with AFSK is that you can uh, uh, have uh, automatic frequency control on that changes your audio frequency. And so it allows you to, as you're tuning to a signal, for it to capture it and bring it in. But that means that your transmit signal is now going to be not zero beat with the person you're calling. And so there's a, a function called net um, that uh, zeroes your transmit audio tones with your um, receive audio tones so that you are zero beat. To kind of counteract that that automatic frequency control. Obviously, if you have those two things set up wrong, then you're going to have um, have a problem. So again, I talked about uh, the duty cycle. Uh, we were talking at, at dinner about nowadays. Um, if you wanted to get on tonight and just see if your rigging setup works, there's nobody on unless you catch an eight or L bulletin. Uh, or a contest, and it just so happens on Thursday night is a 30 minute uh, practice contest that uh, goes on. And so that's a good activity to, uh, to test out your equipment and so forth. But other than that, there just uh, is almost no ready on, on the air at all. And then uh, multi op uh, contest uh, operations are a good way to, to get experience in, in ready. So uh, this is a summary slide of, of what we just went through. So the other cynical thing has to do with the setup, and that is that really is a pain to set up. And I can attest to that even after 25 years, every time I first want to set up ready, something doesn't work uh, and I have to troubleshoot it. So um, I think I just have learned to just calm down and just kind of expect that that might happen and realize that troubleshooting is just part of it. I've, you know, I've got a polarity switch, I've plugged something in wrong, I've got something set up wrong in my software or my hardware. And so uh, my advice is don't, don't get worked up over, don't get frustrated. Just realize that we all go through that and, and uh, we have to understand it. It's actually pretty simple, but there are a lot of parts and if you get Anything wrong, it's it's like uh, you know getting one letter wrong in a computer. It just doesn't work. So my advice in really is to not try to do everything all at once. Set up um, your your really uh, software encoder and decoder. To worry about the logger and get the receive and transmit working before you integrate it with whatever logging system that you're you're going to use because that just adds another layer of of um, knobs and connections that can be set up wrong and then you have to start troubleshooting all over again. So other than the um, the encoder and the decoder for RIDI, the rest of the station is just like CW or sideband. There's nothing magical or different about RIDI except for the encoder decoder because as human, we can't do that with our brain, or at least I don't know very many people that, that can. <laughs> and so this slide talks about uh, what, what the receive encoder is and the, the uh, transmit encoder and uh, how that works with, um, in the case of transmit with AFSK and, and FSK.
So here's a diagram of what um, the, the two types of, of transmission are like. On the receive side, which is the left hand part of uh, these two comparisons, is the receive audio coming from the radio and going in for the decoder. And that's the same in either case. So when someone says they're on FSK, uh, they're either misspeaking or they're precisely saying, that's the way I'm transmitting. You don't receive FSK differently than AFSK. On the air, they sound the same, unless there's something that's not adjusted right. But on the transmit side, for AFSK, it's just the, the sym uh, symmetrical um, analog of, uh, of the receive. You just got audio going from your sound card and computer into the radio. So it's just the, the same uh, hardware-wise, uh, just in reverse. But for FSK, remember I said there's actually a keying cable here, and it's just it's the same circuit as you would have for keying CW. If you have a, um, a CW uh, keyer that goes into uh, your transmitter, that output transistor is exactly the same as what we do in uh, in FSK. It's just the encoding that's that's different. So one of the things that almost always happens with ready setup is that there will be static or uh, hum and so forth. Um, as you're connecting your equipment together, you'll get ground loops. Yeah. And you can go through from an engineering standpoint and eliminate the ground loops. But sometimes it's very hard with commercial equipment to get, to get a, depending on how they tie ground the chassis and so forth. So the easiest way is to use what's commonly on eBay or Amazon called uh, ground loop uh, isolators, which are just one-to-one -one transformers. This is an example of a Born transformer. It's just a one-to-one -one, uh, transformer that just uh, completely eliminates any, any noise or, or hum or uh, anything from uh, differential uh, voltage on your uh, between your equipment. And this is one I made. 20 years ago for a TS950, I took one of these transformers, just hardwired the cables to it and put it in uh, heat shrink and uh, just put that between my uh, uh, computer and, uh, and the radio. So here's examples of what you can buy on eBay or, or Amazon. I use something like this one in the lower left hand corner, uh, which is just 3.5 millimeter connector stereo just has a transformer inside. They're very inexpensive. I keep a bunch of those in my kit and whenever I have a problem on RIDI or anything else, and we're setting up headphones and so forth, I just throw that in. It's much faster than trying to actually figure out what the, the actual problem is. Uh, some radios, this is an example of the K3, have those transformers built in. So all of the audio um, jacks on the back of the, uh, of this radio already have that, that isolation transformer in. Um, the uh, K3S model uh, has that as well, but they added uh, uh, USB in addition to a serial input. And over the USB, there's actually a sound card or a codec in the radio. And so you don't even have to use the sound card in, in your PC. You can use it uh, with the one that's, uh, that's in the radio. So for receiving, uh, this is um, a screenshot of the, the audio spectrum that you get in MNTTY, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. That's the, if you're just getting starting in RIDI, that's what I would recommend you start with, because it's a standalone program. It's free. Uh, it's been around since 2000. Uh, very capable, and uh, everybody uh, that's been in RIDI has probably used it at one time or another. Um, anyway, this is the, the, the audio spectrum. And what I uh, advise is that you set the no signal, just the band noise and receiver noise level uh, of, the, of the audio level at the bare minimum. So it's just tickling the baseline. The reason for that is it gives you the biggest dynamic range for the range of signals that you receive from weak signals to strong signals. So if you were to, to have your level, your gain where the, the band noise no signal noise is up here in the middle. You just reduce your your dynamic range of signals that you could receive by fifty percent. 
these are just the things that I, I think I mentioned earlier about when you set up for AFSK, you need to make sure that uh, your compressor is off if you're using a, a sideband transmitter. Again, nowadays, if you have a modern transceiver that's in the RIDI mode doing AFSK, they probably automatically turn that off. All the Elecraft radios see that. Um, and uh, flex and so forth, that is automatically turned off. And secondly, you need to make sure that you adjust the level correctly. It needs to be high enough that you're getting full power output, but not so high that you're distorting and uh, putting spurious signals across the, the band. For uh, AFSK, you can just use box, but for FSK, you need a transmit the start and stop signal. And so you use push to talk for that. So in the FSK keen circuit that I talked about, you actually need two transistors, one to key push to talk and one to key FSK. And this is an example of uh, that. This is the circuit I was talking about. It's just a base resistor and an MPN transistor that just pulls down the FSK um, line in the uh, radio. The same thing for CW, the same circuit is what's used going into a CW input on a, on a radio. But for FSK, you need to have two of these circuits. And I uh, build mine in, in the, the connector hood of a DB9 uh, connector and just do point to point wiring in there with the four components. And then there's no box or anything. It's just basically a, a cable. Um, a few years ago, a, um, a, a friend of mine out in New York wrote a program for the Arduino uh, microprocessor that just takes ASCII from the logger or from your computer and generates the FSK. So instead of having that done in a program in the computer uh, with the very um, variations you might have with, with window signing and so forth. This is all external in a separate processor. And it's in a, this, this little box is uh, one by one by two inches. It's very, it's just like a lumpy cable. And uh, so what you, you connect uh, via USB to your computer and if the software, if your logging software or your RIDI software has an option for this, this software which is called Tiny FSK, uh, then it will send ASCII instead of the actual auto code, and uh, this external process will send it. So that's a, a really nice feature. And this is just showing uh, the evolution of that product. They're now uh, just about to release the uh, version 5, which uh, has a lot more capability, which I won't get into uh, tonight, and I've been uh, beta testing uh, that, that animal as well. On the market, you can find a lot of uh, different um, boxes for, for RIDI that do the things that I talked about so far, the isolation transformer, the, the FSK beam, and so forth. Um, I've never um, really used these except just to test a few of them. Uh, I prefer to just keep it simple in my mind and just if I need a isolation transformer, I put one in. If I need, if I'm doing FSK team and I, right now I'm using the tiny FSK and all of that, uh, it, that's all I have in my, my radio. But these are available if you don't want to do it yourself. Uh, there's some higher end boxes like uh, the Rig Expert and then the Microham uh, boxes. Unfortunately, uh, I just realized this last year, Microham here in the U.S. is uh, pretty much go uh, has gone out of business and um, DX Engineering has a few of the boxes, but a lot of them, like this uh, large SO2 box, SO2R box, is no longer available. There is a, um, a version uh, three of the micro tier, which is this uh, thing right here. This is the version two. There's a version three that's available. So this SO2R box, this one, uh, this here, and um, another new product that they have are available from DX Engineering. And this is these products do more than just really. They they do uh, they have a, a wind key uh, inside, and so it's kind of a station accessory integration box, if you will. Um, again, I've uh, I've tested these. I personally I don't use them on a day to day basis, but, but they're available if you like that sort of thing. 
So this is a, a summary on the receive side. Uh, that's really pretty pretty simple. It's just an audio table. And uh, the hardest thing is getting, you know, depending on what your transmitter is, making sure that you can get into the connector. Some of the transmitters have a, you know, seven or nine pin bin connector on it. So you need to get into that to get your, your sound cards. And for AFSK, it's just the same thing in, in the offices. Um, so this is a summary for that. Um, and then for FSK, again, uh, it's just like setting up for CW. It's, you need a serial port. Um, in, in today's computer, that's going to be a USB uh, port that uh, sets up a virtual serial port and then uh, keeps the, uh, the FSK line, just like CW. So for decoders, I mentioned earlier that I recommend uh, this MMTTY. You can Google that. Like I said, it's free. You can uh, download it, and it will operate standalone. In other words, you can just run this program, set up the hardware that I've described so far, and get on ready. It actually has kind of a rudimentary even logging program in there and a little method array and so forth. So it's really self-contained. Uh, none of the other decoders and encoders have that. So that's why I recommend that you start here. This is kind of the classic modern way other than the old uh, oil machine of doing uh, of doing ready and this shows you what uh, what the part of the screen looks like there's that spectrum that um, i talked about earlier and so the next uh, three or four slides go through and just talk about uh, different things um, options in in the uh, in the window that you should have in certain uh, things i'll talk later about um, unshipped on stage ULS. Make sure that's turned on both for receive and, and transmit. We'll talk about that later. But up here in, in the MMPPY window, the top part is you have some control buttons, some messages, your spectrum display, and then this large area is your receive. So if you're tuning across the band, you tune across a ready signal, anything that you, that you receive, whether it's noise or garbage or actual, you know, intelligent text, it's all going to print out uh, in this area here. And then this small area in the bottom is where you can type what you're going to send. And you can type ahead, you can you know, fill that out, and then when you hit transmit up here, turn on your transmit, then it skews it out at the proper speed and, and time. And so the next few slides go through the um, option menu, which is up here. When you bring that down, there's um, a menu item to get you into the window sound control so you can set your, your level there. And uh, and then at the bottom here, you get into uh, the MMTTY uh, option uh, menu, which looks like this. It has six, seven tabs across here, and uh, each of them has uh, a number of functions that, that you can set. I recommend don't touch anything unless you're sure about what you're changing. But there are a lot of things in here that uh, take a PhD and in, uh, in spectrum physics to uh, understand what, what they're doing in the algorithm. So you may not want to just uh, completely experiment with that. But I've highlighted on the slides various things. So here's where you would set your tones. And like I said, the default is up around two kilohertz. There's a drop down menu here, and you can select any tone pair that you want. And I recommend a low tone pair. But you need to pick one that's compatible with the radio because not all radios will cover all of these tone pairs. So you need to make sure that your radio will do a low tone pair and which exact frequencies it is to, uh, to be able to uh, set it up here. But if you set that up as your hand default, then when you hit this hand button down here, it automatically goes to whatever you set it to if it ever gets out. And here's uh, an instance of where you can reverse the, the mark and, and space uh, tones. This is uh, in the, the TX window. Here's the uh, where the unshipped on space is. We'll talk about that later. Um, I'm not going to go through all these here tonight. You can pretty much uh, read this and see um, what what they all are. It's a miscellaneous uh, uh, setup. Down here, there's a clock speed, and this needs to be um, 
synchronized with the um, the clock speed that's in in Windows. So if you go into the Windows Sound app that I talked about later on the previous screen, you can get there from M and TTY. You go in there and you go to I think it's the advanced screen, and you can select stereo or mono at different DVD quality, basically uh, sampling rates. And you want to pick a sampling rate that's an even multiple of what you said here. So you need to get these two the same. So I said I pick uh, 4,400, and in here I'm sorry, 48,000. And in here, I pick uh, 12,000. So it's an exact uh, four times relationship. So you want to make sure that those uh, are coordinated. And then the last uh, 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 panel in this, uh, in this options thing lists all of the sound cards that are in your computer. And then you pick the one that you want to use during the PQI. If you had uh, this particular screen doesn't show it, but if you had a radio like a K3 or an ICOM radio that has a sound card built in, it'll be listed here, and then you can you can select that. So in terms of software, normally now I go into a subroutine about contesting software, which some of you I'm sure use like N1MM, but uh, probably for for DXing. Uh, the uh, preeminent uh, software, I think, nowadays is DX Lab Suite, and it has a, uh, a, a sub uh, application in it called Win Warbler, and that's where all the RIDI and the digital uh, PSK and FT8 and so forth uh, are integrated in. And they have integrated in MMPTY, which I've been talking about, and then Two Tone, which is the other um, very popular. In fact, Nowadays, more popular than MMPTY, decoder, encoder for RIDI. And again, tonight I won't get into the comparisons or the reasons why, but just know that, uh, that that's available. And um, one of the nice things about Two Tone is that it doesn't have all that um, blizzard of menus and options that you need to choose. Uh, it's actually set up as very few options you need to worry about. And so it's very um, Easy to not get uh, off in the weeds with uh, with using Qtone, and it's um, it has some some improvements in the software algorithm, the Fourier transforms that do all of the, the looking at the signal and decoding and so forth, and so uh, it does have uh, some advantages in some, in some instances. Uh, this is just a graph that shows probably hard to see depending you know, on where you're sitting. It lists all the various loggers that came in. Um, I looked at two contests, uh, 2012 and 22, um, with its uh, RIDI, and just compared, and you can see that N1MM um, is basically the dominant one. I mean, it, that's its first uh, bar here, and uh, you can see everyone else is just in the noise in terms of popularity. So that's what, in the contesting world uh, for RIDI, what, what is being uh, mostly used nowadays. So these are just uh, some information on the, the three main contest loggers that are used. Um, nowadays, there's a, a um, logger that it looks like Windows, but it's called PX log, and it's actually free as opposed to being a, a subscription or a, a pay for uh, um, logger, and it has some advantages and features over Windows, but it operates the same way and it looks the same on the screen. So that's another one that um, that can be considered on here. So uh, Blizzard are details that we've uh, gone through, but uh, this slide just kind of summarizes how I would go through the setup. Start simple and then start adding your logger and going to another decoder and doing multiple decoders and that sort of thing to, to build it up. But start simple. And by the way, when I set up and something doesn't work, I go back to this, I strip everything away, start off in my troubleshooting tree with just the bare basics. And uh, that's usually where I find the problem, by the way. So um, I'm gonna talk about some specific topics now. One is uh, receive bandwidth. You know, I got started in ready. I thought like a CW operator, the two tones are 170 Hertz apart. So, Maybe a 200 hertz filter would be really great, right? Because it would take out all the noise and everything. Well, then a few years later, some of the, the software um, designers that design these decoders 
tapped me on the shoulder at convention and said, uh, uh, Ed, you need to understand something. In our algorithms, we need a wider spectrum. We need more than 200 hertz. We need at least 500 hertz because we're looking, even though the tones are only uh, 170 hertz apart, we're looking at the skirts and we're looking outside that and we can make better decisions. We can have a lower error rate in our decoding by having a wider spectrum. So don't use a narrow IF filter. Use about 500 hertz. And uh, I've used that worldwide in uh, contests when I've been you know, on the DX side, which I often am the uh, pop of 49 X-ray in Aruba. Tremendous pileups. And uh, if I, I've tried experimenting, narrowing down the, the uh, filter, and it doesn't help and often hurts. The only, there, there's rare occasions if there's somebody that's pumping the AGC, and if I'm running AGC very strongly, that uh, a narrow filter may help in that case, but it's very rare. And uh, in a contest situation or a DX situation, I don't want to have to be experimenting with that sort of thing. So uh, 500 hertz is proven to be uh, the sweet spot on that. The second thing is that both um, ICOM and the Elecraft radios have what's called a dual tone filter, or uh, ICOM calls it twin peak. And this is where they put a DSP filter around each of the tones. So again, in my CW thinking mind, I think, oh, that's really cool. And based on what I just said, you can see that uh, that's not so cool from um, the way that the software is designed, the algorithm. So um, turn those off. And by the way, I'll confess, the K3 dual tone filter is only there because I insisted on it in field tests back in 2007 before I got enlightened as to uh, how this really works. So now I have to tell everybody to stop using it. Um, this is a big, big problem in RIDI, and that's the transmit bandwidth. And uh, for a TW operator in the group, you'll remember years ago, and it still happens nowadays, but not as much, uh, especially some of the ASU radios had adjustments where the operator could uh, adjust the rise and fall time of their TW signal. And if you got that, it kept the rise time too, too steep, and the fall time too steep, it generated all kinds of key clicks and uh, spurious signals you know, around your signal on the band causing URM. And it's exactly the same thing in RIDI. And until um, 2013, when Elecraft put some wave shaping in their um, firmware in the K3, prior to that, every radio on the market had this problem, very wide uh, signal, uh, especially with, uh, with FSK. And, uh, and so uh, these next slides go through and just show you some um, um, examples of that. So here's a signal with MMTTY that's unfiltered. So within MMTTY, you can actually set uh, a filter to narrow your transmit signal. If you don't have that turned on, uh, this is what the signal looks like. By default, if you don't, if you just install MMTTY and don't change anything, it has a filter that's called uh, 48 tap filter. And this is what it looks like. You can see it's a little bit better than the unfiltered. But there's the option to increase the taps up to 512, and look how much narrower it makes the signal and what the what the skirts look like down here. So uh, one of the things I really advocate people do if you're using MMTTY for AFSK is to go in to that screen and change the taps from the default 48 to 512. Um, and then here is uh, two tone. Remember, two tone, as I said, doesn't have any uh, adjustments or parameters that you can set. And uh, this is what the two tone AFSK looks like. And it's every bit as good as the uh, MMPTY with the 512. Um, in fact, the, the lower search actually, uh, actually looks better. And um, uh, here's, here's where you set it on the, uh, the PX tab. And uh, it has PX uh, bandpass filter, and here's uh, where you set it the default 48. You need to move it to 512. Keytone also has a differential on off between kind of a different algorithm for uh, AFSK, 
And uh, here's what it looks like compared to the others. And it's even narrower. And that's what um, David Wicks, the author of um, the Fleet Zone, recommends using. And that's one of the selections you can make in the in the two zone. And this uh, graph shows uh, what the impact is as you add an amplifier. So if you look at what all these things look like at one watt compared to 100 watts or compared to one and a half kilowatts, uh, you can see that uh, as you go up in power, just between one milliwatt and 100 watts, the signal gets, gets really wide. And so that's another reason why you want to make sure that your transmit signal is, uh, is clean. Well, that was all uh, AFSK. FSK, as I said earlier, uh, typically most radios don't have any wave shaping in the DSP to, uh, to um, restrict the bandwidth. Um, Elecraft is the only one that I know of today that, that does that. And this is what uh, the difference was. This is looking at the K3 with the firmware before they put the wave shaping in. And all this is is DSP code. All this is is just loading the firmware in the radio, and that's the difference. But most radios today look like that if they're running FSK. So a lot of us recommend, just for the sanity on the bands, um, recommend people to use AFSK. So remember earlier I said about the difference between AFSK and FSK. This is a very good reason to use uh, AFSK. You just got to make sure that it's that it's adjusted properly. Okay, uh, unchipped on space. This is um, the new model is uh, is UOF, um, and this is a uh, protocol that was invented decades ago when uh, teletype, uh, you know, news uh, clippings were being transmitted, right? And most of the text was alphanumeric, and so. To add a, a bit of noise immunity about those control characters getting zapped, uh, they came up with this protocol that said whenever you see a space character, wherever you are, shift back the letters. Assume that the, the following text is going to be letters. So, UOS on the transmitter side, then, guess what? Whenever there's a space, and the next letter or the next character is going to be a number, then you have to insert a figures. Even, even if the previous word was figures and a space comes along, which is in both character sets, if you have UOS on, you now have to implicit or explicitly send a, um, uh, a figures character. And so that's why you need to have both UOS turned on for receive and for transmit. Unfortunately, in 2000, and then PTI was written, so you had all of this uh, uh, variability that you could adjust, but there's no reason to have them be different. They either ought to both be off or both be on. And we recommend that they be on because uh, two-tone, for example, there's no way to turn it off. It just is on by design. And a lot of software is like that. So for you to be compatible with people you're talking to, the best bet is to make sure that if you're using them DPY, we have UOS uh, turned on. Uh, the second thing is you'll see some people will put a, uh, a hyphen when they're sending numbers. Now, for DXing, this isn't so much an issue, but in contesting where you send serial numbers, you send 599 and a serial number, and they say, oh, if I put a, a um, hyphen in there, it will defeat, it's not a space character, so UOS will turn on and I'll save one character, one control character in my transmission. Well, that works great for that use case or that example. But if you go through all the possible examples that you could have with text and numbers and so forth, um, you're better off to just use always the UOS on and both receive and transmit and use space for your word delimiters. Don't use um, Hyphens, which you'll see sometimes on on the rear, but again, that, that mostly comes up just in uh, in context. And here's where you turn it on uh, in MNTTY. On the main panel, you can do it for uh, receive, although it's not labeled that way. It's, it says UOS, and then you have to go to the transmit uh, tab under options to turn it on for yes. But once you turn it on, 
then it, uh, it stays on. Um, okay, the next topic is multiple decoders. So the decoders are free, right? You can download the software. And so the only cost really is CPU performance, which you have enough um, performance in your CPU, and most of you now do to be able to handle multiple decoders. Um, and screen space. So if you have a large enough screen where you can put multiple decoder windows up there, the really great advantage of this is you can set up each of those for different decoding algorithms. So MMTTY, for example, has built in a half a dozen different um, decoding profiles, as all well, I think. For flutter and QRM and fading and um, things like that. So if you set up a window for different uh, conditions, as you're receiving a signal, oftentimes one of those windows will copy perfectly where the others won't. And if you had picked one and you just had one decoder window, you're just playing the odds of whether you're going to copy or not. So uh, since it's free, I advocate that uh, people look at setting up multiple decoder windows. Um, there's no extra hardware or anything. It uses the same audio signal. It just uses a different software algorithm to uh, decide on the character that's going to be So that's what uh, multiple decoders is all about. Um, this is just a summary of uh, MMTTY, a little bit of history on it. Same thing for a two phone. And another one that's not um, used a lot, but it is, you can integrate it with, uh, with N1MM. Uh, it's called Pretty. Uh, it's written by um, uh, the VE, the, the Russian uh, up in Canada that, that, that wrote uh, all of our skimmer software, Alex, um, wrote this uh, decoder. And it is really sophisticated. And it'll be going along and it will print uh, something and then a couple seconds later it will go back and reprint it go back to what it already had on the screen and correct it based on some Bayesian uh, statistics that it does uh, on the on the signals that it's processing so uh, it's very capable but uh, actually it's, it's not uh, in in uh, wide use mainly uh, tone and uh, and PY. so I run when I operate, I have six decoders on each radio. Uh, four of them are on the main receiver and two of them are on the sub receiver. Because uh, I'm often working on the same band but with one radio, I'm interleaving uh, two QSOs uh, on, on the same band by using the two receivers. And so on two different, I'm going to be running, for example, on one frequency and tuning with the sub receiver. And when I find a signal or a station that I haven't worked, then I'll interleave. When he's transmitting, I'm receiving, but I'm transmitting on my uh, other um, uh, receiver frequency to the QSO that I'm in, so you can interleave that. Kind of like SO2R, but with, but with, one, uh, with one radio. Uh, so here's an example of uh, uh, MNTTY. This is uh, uh, right log is logger, but here's the two windows. So you see I've shrunk them down. I got rid of all the buttons because during operation, once you set up the configuration, you don't need all these buttons. So there's an ability to get those off the screen and just get down to just the receive uh, window and the audio spectrum. And you really don't need, if you have multiple MMTTY windows, you only really need one uh, audio spectrum because all you're using it for is tuning. You don't need to see that for each of the decoders. So you can scrunch this down quite a bit. Here's an example with four. And you can see I've scrunched it down even further. And you only need, you know, four or five lines on here for uh, for most uh, episodes. You don't need to see the long history. And you can scroll back if you need to, but you very seldom um, is that needed. And here's an example where there's just one audio frequency. This um, um, window here is a hardware decoder. I took all the hardware modems out of, of this talk because nowadays I don't think anyone is using hardware decoders. I used a hardware decoder as one of my multiple decoders up until about I don't know, eight or 10 years ago. And um, it just did not work the, the hassle and the, the space of setting that up. The, the software decoders are good enough. And with all of these different profiles that I talked about earlier that you can set up, 
So you pretty much cover the, the base without um, the hardware. Uh, the other thing that um, that you can do is you can set up um, with your second receiver, sub receiver, and a radio. You can set up uh, a different IF uh, bandwidth. So you might say 500 hertz with the sweet spot. You might set one up for 400 and another one up for 600, or maybe one for 250 for those rare cases where your AGC is getting pumped. And uh, again, you've got both of them there. And so on that rare occasion where uh, the narrower filter actually helps, it's free and you don't have to ask for a repeat. It's already there for you to uh, to see what the what the result is. So this is an example that I, I already explained about uh, SO2V. That just means using two receivers. If your uh, radio has two receivers, being able to work uh, two QSOs uh, interleaved uh, at, at the same time on the same band. Um, so again, I talked about low tones are less fatiguing, but I've only got two ears, so if I'm listening to more than two audio streams, again, I'm, I don't need to hear it so precisely and decode it, but I need to be able to hear it to know when it comes on and off. And so what I do is I just set some of the streams at low tone, some of them at high tone. So on one ear, I can have two or three audio streams, but because of different audio tone, it gives me a sense of which radio or which receiver that I'm, I'm operating on. Uh, this is now I'm kind of getting into contest stuff. Uh, this is uh, more detail about the uh, SO2V. Um, there's been a mnemonic that's come up in the last several years called 2B SIQ. And what this is is two band um, synchronized uh, interleave Q shows. And so this is where you think about a Q show, there's a CQ, you send an exchange. He sends an exchange and then you say QSL or thank you and you go on. So there's four basic stages in that. You narrow those and have two Q shows going on at once in parallel. You don't have to finish one Q show completely and then go to the next one because when you're receiving, you, uh, he can be translating, right? And vice versa. So that's what it's all about. And you can do that on one radio, which is just what I call one DSIQ or uh, SO2R um, is uh, uh, 2BSIQ. So that's where you're actually running on two different radios generally and uh, interleaving the, the QSO. And believe it or not, there's some mutant people amongst our hobby that can do that on CW at high speed and make 12,000 QSOs in a weekend and, uh, and do email while all of this is going on. So. Um, but with RIDI, remember, you don't have to do decoding like you do with CW. And so you can actually, uh, mere mortals can, can do some of this stuff. So this is an example of um, the setup I had a week ago in, in Aruba um, for just SO2R. And I said most um, SO2R setups are one computer uh, with two radios connected. And then there's software and sometimes they'll little controller software that moves the focus between the two at the right time, and the operator has to do some of that focus moving himself. Um, I don't like that paradigm. What I do is I have two complete stations. So this is like a what I call a multi two station. So it's like a condensed station that has two complete stations, and they're in that category where there can be two operators operating independently on different bands. And so that's what I set up. Of course, I'm just one operator. So I sit, uh, first of all, I use keyboards without numeric pads. For really, you don't need that. I set them up very tightly together in front of the radios. And um, I've trained myself over the last 30 years. I'm right-handed, but I can run a mouse equally well with my left hand because uh, outside of radio, I use a left-handed mouse on my office computer just to keep my left hand trained for that because my right hand knows how to do it. And uh, so that's what um, what is shown here uh, in the conversation. Uh, this probably shouldn't have been in here. This is just some detail on how to do one of the bigger content. So with the way I set up for SO2R, you can extend that 
to three radios or four radios, right? You can just go to like a multi op station that has stations on six bands and get everything close enough together that one operator can operate them all. Now, the reality of it is, of course, that there's only so much time in time, right? So you can really only interleave two at a time. But there are ways that you can use um, at least a third. It gets kind of uh, dicey to, to like, like how you can use it for. But um, I use a third one. Um, and here's a, a setup that I, I used a week ago where I had the normal SO2R set up here. And then I had a third complete station with amplifier and everything uh, set up here with uh, this having to be a phase three radio. And um, I just put that on either 10 or 80 meters. So I had I set up some manual switches so I could pull either the 10 meter Yagi or the 80 meter Daiko out of the SO2R system and dedicate it to this third radio. So what that meant was during the day, I could have, there's basically three bands active, 10, 15, and 20. I could have all three bands, the radios going, uh, the loggers going, and watching that, and as soon as I see a multiplier or a station that I want to work, I can jump on. I don't have to switch band or anything. They're just, they're, they're all right there in front of me. And then the, at night, 80, 40, and, and 20, and you can do the same thing. So that's that's why um, one of the reasons I advocate that. The other thing is that in the middle of operating, if something goes wrong, I like my stations. These are all usually identical radios and PCs, and everything's the same. If something goes wrong, and usually I can keep operating on one while I'm truck troubleshooting the other one. And if they're different radios, different brands, and everything, it's uh, more problematic to be able to to do that yeah, troubleshooting. Okay, I think the last topic here um, is um, I'm going to diverge into sailboat racing. Now, one part of my uh, life, my wife and I uh, were into holy cat racing, and so we were doing sailboat racing. If you know anything about buoy racing, um, this is where you, you sail around two or three buoys that are anchored off in the water and uh, see who can get around all of them maybe two or three times and back to the finish line. Well, what happens is if you're coming into a buoy, there's only space. I mean, there's just physical space for boats. If you come in next to the buoy, you're going to have the shortest path around that buoy, right? And so uh, if you were coming in through the buoy neck and neck of another boat, you're going to come out ahead when you pass that buoy because you're on the inside. So in sailboat racing, everybody's fighting to be inside. Sometimes there's a collision either with the buoy or with other boats uh, because of that, because that's the favorable position. Well, if you find yourself on the outside here and you can't get to the inside, what do you do? What's the what's the next best strategy to do? Slow down, right? So I call it slow down the wind. And it's the same thing with... Uh, with radio, if you're um, at a DX location, like the guys that are in Clipperton, and they're running this big pileup, they can work the first call that they get clearly. And then, by the way, this applies to any mode, but it works really well with, with radio. They can work the first call that comes through that they get, either they copy in their head of a CW or, or on ready, or they can just wait a beat. I mean, literally a, a fraction of a second. And if they sense that there's a pileup, oftentimes another two or three calls will come in. Well, guess what you can do? You can skip, you don't need to call CQ again, right? You, now you've got a list of calls that you can work. So instead of calling CQ and having a pileup answer again, you eliminate those two phases. Remember I said there were four phases? You've now increase your speed instantaneously dynamically by twos because you've gotten rid of the CQ and the pileup phases and you just keep you say okay thank you Joe now Sam thank you Sam now Andy and you just keep going like that and we've done that for years in um, in CW and side dance called tail ending so you're in QSO with somebody uh, and DSing the same way and someone drops their call in it's really dangerous because nine times out of ten you put it in the wrong place and you cause QRM. But if you can do it eloquently, it really speeds things up. And so uh, 
That's that's what call sign stacking is just a term that means I got more than one call. I stacked them up and I'm going to work them in sequence. And um, a lot of people um, know that I operate this way and uh, they'll, they'll purposely, you know, we'll be at the end of the QSO and there's a dead time and a random call will, will go in there and then I'll just work it um, the next time and, and skip those two cycles. So this is, uh, you can look at this later, these are what I just talked about, the four phases of the QSO uh, for running or for uh, S&P. And then uh, how you can skip these first two phases and just go directly from thank you to uh, working the next the next station. And this is the summary slide of that. And we're at the end. This is the resource slide. A few uh, URLs here of things that uh, uh, that I talked about that are good resources to learn more about uh, the. Yeah, operation. Uh, a lot of them are kind of contest directed, but there's still uh, a lot of good information in there. And I don't know of any other sites that are particularly uh, uh, good or clean to DXing more than, than what these are. So it's good, uh, good reference. So uh, a lot of slides, a lot of time. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. It's up to you guys. So in in PW in pileup, there's certain techniques that you use to break the pileup. How is that the same or different in then Oh good question. So I don't know if everyone heard the question. So is there anything different you do in ready pileups to break a pileup, um, like some of the techniques that we use in sideband and, and CW? Uh, yeah, there's really one big one in ready. For whatever reason, which I've never figured out, and after doing this for 25 years, it still exists. There are times when there's huge amounts of silence. Well, milliseconds, but that's huge when you can drop a call in. And so that's the first thing is be aware of that, get into the rhythm of, of where the, you know everyone's calling and then there's silence and dump their calling. You do the same thing in CW, but it's really prevalent and and ready. And so that's that's one thing we do. Um on there's several parts to that question. So if you're on the, the pileup side, if you're the DX station, um, what I do is I always make sure that I work the first the first station I work is the first one that I that I copy. Because uh, over time, statistically, what that does is it trains everybody to listening to make short calls and um, to realize that they can't jump in. If there's been a whole bunch of calls, they can't jump in and get my attention, even if it's in the clear. Because if I've gotten a good copy, I will, not, even if it's a louder station, and when I'm at DX station, even if it's a relatively, the station that calls me is relatively rare, like in the contest is a mold, I still won't work them if they weren't the first one. Because it, it's really important to me to play the long game, which is to train everybody in my operating style that I'm going to work the first clear call that I get. And so that kind of migrates people to just call them once or twice. Um, there's still some people that have a messy program with their call four times. Don't do that. Just have a message with your call once, tap it however many times for that instance, you need to, to send it. Like if someone asks for your call again, well, then I just tap it several times. But when I'm calling somebody, I very seldom tap it more than once. Um, and, but, and never more than twice, uh, just, just for that reason. So yeah, there's some things like that. activity outside of conference? Um, the short answer is no, and I used to be able to say, well, yeah, the expeditions, and that's not so much true anymore, as we all know, a lot of the expeditions are giving up their, their digital operation is FP8, um, so no, the, uh, the one exception to that is Thursday nights, and we have our meetings here, every week, 52 weeks a year, for 30 minutes, there's a uh, ready practice contest, if you will. Uh, on on the air and the scores are posted at 38 30. That's a great way to practice ready 
and to, and to test out your setup, you know, set it up and operate and so forth. Um, and then the third thing is the eight hour bullet, then you can copy, you can work on the receipt side of your review. But other than those three things, contest, eight RL, and this one weekly, midweek contest, um, it, it is really hard. Well, I'll give you an example. I was in Aruba for a week before the ready roundup. I got on for three or four hours every single day calling CQ simultaneously on two bands, three or four hours a day. At the end of the week, I worked had worked 103 contacts. I could have worked thousands if people had been on. But I mean, even with the, the skimmers and the spotting, spotting me and everything, there were just very, very few people on. And by the way, while I was sitting a few kilohertz above the FPA stub band, they were all fewer in than each other. I mean, it was just a zoo in there, right? Um, when I was on, and here I was up CQing with no caller. And there are people that still want a, a Ruby QSL card these days, but uh, there was nobody on the reading. So unfortunately, the answer to your question is uh, kind of a resounding, uh, kind of a negative. What, what other items? Uh, Can't most of this be uh, avoided all the stuff? It's really modern radio. Yeah, that's what you're using. It's a radio. All I have to do on this keyboard is I've got a keyboard in it. I've got a single. No, that's a that's a excellent point. Almost uh, any modern radio now has encoding and decoding built in, but it just stops right there. It's a completely different system. It's not integrated into your log or anything else. If it were, if we had a protocol for that and some standards for doing that, that would be the cat's meow because uh, then you wouldn't have to worry about all this, everything I talked about tonight. But there's there's principles in that. The logger's purpose is anyway to log. I'm not eating all of those attributes that the M1MM breaks with it because radio is having that internal. Well, I'm sending and seeing automatically for the keyboard. But you want the reason you want it in, in the log is so that you don't have to type anything. So I, I go through a contest. I, I go through a contest. I don't type anything on the His keyboards are basically, they're like special function keys. I have three or four keys that I use that are that are macros that send messages. And like it, when I do call stacking, I hit two keys. I hit my thank you, you know, W6, uh, OPO, now, so and so. The thank you message is one key, and it's right net. I remap all these keys right around the inner key. So with either my left or my right hand on the keyboard, there are two or three keys. I can work the whole contest and let something you know, fall apart just by hitting those keys. Because when really the call comes up in the window and it automatically transfers to the log. So if there were a protocol to do that from the radio into the logger, that would be great. Yeah, it's not there yet. It's not there yet. Yeah. But the, you can imagine the technology's there, it's just nobody has done it. That's a good point though, to say that because if that information gets over to the QC to the launcher, then it won't mess up for us. Yeah. And there are certain fields that are automatically get filled in and it happens to go. Where in a way, I keep it real simple. Uh, speaking all in terms of the radio, you know, you got to go over there and type in the call sign and send a break. I don't, but not only do I not type in a call sign, I don't even mouse click on it. No, no. I haven't used right log. Uh, N1MM has a similar feature to what I'm about to describe in right log, but for me, it doesn't work nearly as slick. So in, in right log, I can hit one button, my exchange button. It grabs, I, I can set up right log to say, I want to work the first highlighted call. So super check partials for me. Of all the text that's coming across in a pileup, anything that's a call sign, that's a legal call sign in super check partial, gets uh, highlighted. So I, you can configure it to work the last one that came in or the first one. 
as I said earlier, I, I do the first one. So all I do is hit my exchange key. Right log automatically goes and gets the first highlighted call and sends it change. And while that's going, which takes a second or two, I now take my right, depends on which hand I'm using. I take the, the non, non normal mouse button and I click on the next highlighted call. It goes into that stack that I talked about. And now when I finish the QSO, I get the thank you button and the exchange button again, and it goes on to the next QSO. So I just literally sit there, my hand doesn't move. My fingers are just, you know, hitting one or two keys. And the same thing for search and pound, I have a couple of keys to send my call and then the exchange and so forth. So with Ready, it's really, um, you, you can really automate it. That's very powerful. Yeah. So anybody that's not done ready then encouraged and sent that you want to try it now. One of the things that I, I say, even if you decide you don't particularly like ready, operating that will build your operating skills really fast uh, in a lot of different areas because you don't have brain cells trying to copy side band or CW. Right? It's all being printed for you. So now you can spend that working on other skills. And I, I use SO2R as an example. That may not be your thing, but you can be uh, you know tuning for uh, other DX. You can be uh, thinking about you know what the profit you're looking at propagation information. There's lots of things you can be doing as an operator to optimize whatever your goals are for that operating session if you don't have to copy and decode the and encode the uh, the messages. Just wish there was some casual QSOs going on. <laughs> yeah, you know, everyone bemoans the fact that um, you, you can't actually have a conversation with the uh, DFT mode, but as you just pointed out, there's just not that going on anywhere very much anymore, unfortunately. So I guess I, I kind of feel like. Uh, it must have been like this when uh, AM started to be supplanted by Cyvan, and everyone thought that the the ham radio was, you know, going to go away because of that that transition. And that's how a lot of us feel about some of these new things that are going on. But I began to think maybe I'm just one of those that just plays fight with the year. Well, it seems like a lot of interface with first valleys and people is disappearing. Yeah. Well, as you know, I said earlier, I spend most of my ham radio time in the recent decades uh, in contesting. And that's one, just your point, where I mean, there's no, once in a while you'll say hi to a buddy, but I mean, there's no socialization going on, right? But outside of contests, uh, contesters are really, um, strong on getting together and socializing and uh, trash talking each other and you know just having a great time socially but it's outside of contest and the contesting kind of got them you know together but what that's really special when somebody comes back and says hi bob yeah <laughs> you know? yeah okay, so i i do that once in a while in contests another feature in right log is um, i think anyone in them has it is what the right log people call the friends file so I can make a database of your call and your name. That's all that's in the, the, the data records in this database of all my friends and club members and everything. And in my messages, I can have that programmed in. So if, if I work a call that's not in my friends list, the, there's not a big pause or anything. It just skips over that and keeps going. But if it's on my list and it goes in Bob, and that just blows people away when you're working high speed, right? And you have a friendly, actual human interaction for a millisecond. So it's it's kind of fun, and uh, we can do that. But uh, you're right; the socialization is pretty pretty thin. Okay. Well, thank you very much.